Hello, welcome to this video where I'll be sharing my advice for how you can optimally study for the I4A exams. These exams are one of the biggest hurdles to becoming an actuary, so it's well worth taking the time to organise yourself correctly to maximise your chances of success. I got through the exams in a little over three years using this approach, and I'm confident it will help you too. So, who will benefit from this video? Well, it's pretty much anyone who either hasn't started or hasn't made as much progress through the exams as hopeful. If you're making good progress, then well done. Maybe just stick to what's working for you already. One of the most important parts of optimally studying for the IFO exams is to think about the exams and how they fit into your life holistically. These exams are a huge time commitment. You're going to have ups and downs, and you can find yourself getting bogged down. So having an overarching vision is going to really help drag you through what can feel like a really long slog. Let's look at each of these five key components in turn. Firstly, the IFOA exam structure. There are 13 different subjects to pass, and each of these is made up of one or two exams. The general principle being you should pass the subjects at the top of the slide before moving down through the others. There's less rigidity on order within each row, and that means you still have quite a few choices as to your approach which makes planning out your route very important, as we'll discuss shortly. Now, you can reset each subject as many times as necessary, which is important to note, as these exams do not have high pass rates. Roughly 50% of people pass, and most people who sit these exams are smart and hardworking. So unless you happen to be a genius, you will need to get used to setbacks. This is another reason why you need to have a holistic plan to avoid overreacting to any individual failures. Let's look at the time commitment required. The IFOA helpfully give the number of hours they estimate are required for each exam. In my experience, these are pretty accurate. So again, unless you're a genius, then you'll need to make time in your busy schedule for this amount of effort. Time commitment required is one of the reasons why the actual exams are such a barrier. You have a demanding job and then you're expected to study on top of that, let alone maintaining a social life and relaxing too. You can see that the early exams at the top of the screen tend to need about 150, 250 hours. Then there are two really big exams, CP1 and SA1 to 7, and there are a couple of small subjects, CB3 and CP3. So it's important to plan out your timings to ensure you don't end up needing to pass large subjects at the same time, or instead being forced to delay your progress. Now, let's look at the exam timetable. I've got the September 2021 schedule up here, and the IFOA tend to keep the timing similar from session to session. Currently, all exams take place in the morning, so you can't take, for instance, CM1 and CP2 at the same time. So if you have another restriction to plan to avoid. Where I've got, by the way, where I've got A or B after an exam, it's just showing the two different exams required for an individual subject. You want to sit subjects which don't have exams closely connected in time. The reason being that it's important after an exam to rest a little and then reset your mind for the next exam. But if you have exams on consecutive days or even just a couple of days apart, then this is not going to be possible. And so you will not be optimally prepared for the second exam. As you can see, though, the timetable is spread out over a few weeks, so you should be able to plot a route through which avoids these clashes and ensures you have the best chance of passing each subject. You'll also note CB3 is not really in the timetable. And that's because it's a course you do out of cycle. So you have a bit more leeway to fit that in somewhere in your plan. Now, this is really important. How much time are you prepared to commit to these exams? You've got 52 weeks a year available to you. You'll hopefully have a study package from your employer. And you also have the potential to top that up by studying at the weekend and in the evenings. Personally, I made the commitment I was going to study pretty much every week apart from holidays. And I was going to study every Sunday and two evenings a week on top of my weekly study day from work. I also did a little bit of studying on my commute into work. That sounds like a lot, but actually when you work it out, it gives you about 400 hours per sitting, which as you've seen from the IFOA's recommended study time, means that I could sit about two exams each session. You should definitely do this calculation for yourselves and see how many hours you come up with. If you end up with less than 200 hours per sitting, then I would question whether one exam per session is enough, and I'll discuss why shortly. If you end up with more than 400 hours per sitting, certainly a lot more, then I might question whether you've set yourself up a reasonable plan. 
There's no point ordering four courses and getting stressed out or messing up at work or at home. We want a realistic plan we can stick to over many years. So don't be too optimistic or you might not enjoy this process. And that's a really important point. I actually loved sitting the actual exams. I got paid to play around with numbers all day. I even got paid more when I did well. I got paid to train myself up as a professional and learn loads of interesting and useful things. So don't try and rush through it in two years. You won't enjoy things and you might actually end up overqualified. Remember, students get to ask lots of questions and you might not believe this, but are protected from a lot of things by the qualified actuaries in their teams. Once you switch sides, you get more money, yes, but you also get a lot more responsibility. The last component to consider is your tolerance for failure. In my experience, many actuarial students overly fear failure. So they want to just sit one exam and do it really well and minimise their chance of failure. However, we know that all the people sitting these exams are smart and hardworking, and yet still only half pass each sitting. So to me, leaving my progress down to what was essentially the toss of a coin is not conducive to building the positive momentum you need to get through these exams. Sitting two exams massively moves the odds up in your favour towards progressing through the exams, therefore keeping the support of your family, your boss and yourself too. You're the one putting in all the effort and you need to get the rewards too, whereas your motivation levels can and will drop. By fearing failure and only sitting one exam, many students actually pretty much guarantee they'll get failure. So make room for about 400 hours of study each session and you'll have a much happier time than a cagey approach will bring you. By the way, please don't extrapolate what I've just said to believe that sitting more and more exams each session will optimise your chance of passing. It's only a 50-50 chance if you prepared well and each additional exam will make that optimal preparation less and less likely, not to mention imposing a stressful lifestyle unnecessarily on yourself for potentially no benefit. So find that sweet spot of effort of, and success and stick to it. So let's bring it all together into a detailed plan for which exams to sit when it's studying 400 hours per sitting. Well, first off, sit CM1 and CB1. You can see these are nicely spaced apart so you can focus on each individually. Next, CS1 and CM2. Again, a good week separating them. Then CB2 and CS2, yet again a week apart. Next, we hit CP1, which is a biggie, so it needs a whole solo session. Although you may well be able to squeak in CB3 as well to break things up a little in your study. Now, after one subject in the sitting, we jump up to three, being CP2, CP3, a small one, and an SP. But don't worry, CP3 is short enough, you can probably squeeze it in as well. Here. Next time, we just sit the remaining SP, and then the sitting after that, we hit our fellowship paper, the essay. Obviously, there will probably be need to flex our plans based on the need to resets and also fitting in the outer cycle CB3. If so, we need to reassess our plan again based on the same principles to plot a new course through the exams. However, if we did stick to the plan and we did pass everything the first time, that would be just seven sittings, so three and a half years, which would be an excellent return, but really not an easy thing to do. This is definitely a marathon and we need to mentally prepare for it, knowing that there's going to be setbacks and challenges along the way. Now, let's discuss how to actually use those 400 hours each sitting to optimally have our chance of passing the exam. The first principle is to make studying a habit. I would go so far as to say that having a rest after your exams is actually dangerous. It's so much harder to restart studying than it is to never stop. So if you go away from home for a holiday, fine, don't take your study materials. But otherwise, stick to the schedule week in, week out. Happily, this approach of continuous studying also fits in with the best way of retaining knowledge. I'm not saying that some people can't cram enough knowledge into their heads in the last month or so to pass, but I am saying this is a high risk strategy, totally missing the point of this knowledge being important for your career and hence needing to be in your long term memory and also makes life a lot more stressful. So just keep laying that knowledge into your head regularly throughout the session and it will be there when you need it exam and also beyond in your working life. Next, you need to optimise the time you spend content learning, and actually this means studying little and often. When I first started studying for school exams, I would literally take myself hostage for hours on end in front of my books, but this was wrong on two counts. Firstly, it's hardly fun to study like that, so I was actually naturally reluctant to start studying. 
And even more importantly, your brain is a muscle like any other and cannot keep up that high intensity for hours. It's much more profitable to take regular breaks and give yourself rewards after each period of study, be it a walk or watching some TV or some social media time. And as you know, the next study session will be short again. You'll have the willpower to get back at the desk and into the studying again. In fact, I often had to set a timer to stop myself studying for too long and take the rest as I'd be enjoying the course content so much. Keeping things fresh and also resting your mind, writing hand are important. So avoid studying on consecutive days. Given we'll be studying at the weekend, this pretty much removes Monday and Friday from the equation. OK, near the exams, you might want to take a few consecutive days, but don't be that person who takes the last two weeks off before the exams. No one can study effectively or even write for that many days in a row. So spread those studies out more and you'll get much better knowledge retention and hence results. Lastly, all the knowledge in the world is useless if you don't answer the question posed in the exam or run out of time. So exam technique is critical. And again, something which I had to learn for myself over time. I've made some other study videos which focus on this key aspect, so I won't repeat myself too much in this video. Let's talk a little about how to learn content. From my experience, I had a way of studying which it worked for me, and that was to write out the course twice in full every word, and sometimes three times if something hadn't stuck. This meant that I could literally visualise the study notes when a fact-based question came up, and so it worked really well for me. Know that my writing was pretty much illegible, so it was just a way of getting my mind to focus hard on each word rather than skimming, switching off, as happens when I tend to read lots of information. However, this is clearly not how most people study. I've seen other people's notes and they appear to just highlight a few passages while studying and somehow everything just sticks in their minds. If that's you, then great, do that. Other people make condensed notes from the course materials and then study from those. Again, if it works for you, stick to it. Some people also use flashcards or do lots of questions. You need to experiment until you find the formula which works for you and then stick to it. Now, focus is important here. There's no point hammering the wrong information into your brain. So next you need to find out what to learn. The whole course is there for a reason, and so you need to study everything, but there are clearly parts of each course which the examiners like to focus on. So you need to work out what's important and spend more time studying those parts. I think the number one thing to help you do that is to sit a closed book exam early in your content learning. I used to do this after my first write through of the course. It helps you see what kind of exam you're studying for, which is pretty fundamental, important information, but so often ignored by students until just before the exam itself. Another great thing to do is look at lots of past papers and see which topics and questions came up regularly. I used to find the ACTED asset invaluable here. Again, don't only study what comes up regularly, but it's an open goal to make sure you know how to ask the kind of questions which usually come up. You also need to decide if you're a self-studier or someone who likes tutorials. Given almost all students use them, you may be surprised to hear that I never attended a tutorial. My argument was I didn't want to spend time travelling to the tutorial, spend time introducing ourselves and then have to focus on whatever the group found tricky. I prefer to use that time for studying what was most important and tricky for me. However, many of people are used to using learning in a classroom environment. They like the structure it gives to their studying. They want help with things they can't figure out for themselves and also want to do some networking. So it's actually great. But do think about how you can optimally spend your 400 hours before you automatically sign up for tutorials alongside everyone else. Let's talk briefly about exam practice. This should be your entire focus in the last month. Having laid down the content into your mind, you need to ensure you can reproduce that knowledge efficiently and effectively in the exam. You want to do a mix of open and closed book exam practice. Open book exams reinforce knowledge retention and help you see how the exam is marked. Closed book exams are really important for honing your exam technique, so both should be used. If you do closed book exams, you need to consider whether to have your exams marked or do it yourself. Again, many people just straight away go for the marking, but I never did. The reason being that understanding how to mark my exam scripts meant I had to think like an examiner, and this is vital practice for the exam itself. Of course, other people, they like the structure that mock exam marking gives them, and also they like the personal feedback they get from the marker. So work out what you value more, but don't just automatically follow the crowd. There's lots more to talk about exam technique, and it really is the difference between equally strong candidates passing or failing. So do check out my other videos. On that topic, these are the two videos in question. The first one covering what to do in the last month, focusing on exam practice. 
And the second one, what to do in the last 24 hours, focusing on having optimal brain power in the exam and exam technique. The links for these will appear on the screen shortly, and I hope you find them and this video useful for getting through the IFRA exams. If you do like them, please do like them and also subscribe to my channel to help support me making more videos like this. Good luck in your exams and thank you.